Good morning. Today we are going to talk to Dr. Elifan Danen, a researcher, a lecturer in the Department of Zoology and Entomology. Welcome, Doctor. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for having me here. And Doctor, can you share with us how did you become a researcher? Yeah, that's many, many years ago, so I can hardly remember, but I think the main thing is that I was I had a very enthusiastic teacher in high school, a biology teacher that introduced me to especially genetics, which was a very um, young science at that stage. Um, so when my parents agreed after the sacrifices that they made that I can go to university, that was the direction that I wanted to follow. So I started my BSc studies at uh, the University of Victoria majoring in zoology and genetics but after my third year my father said where on earth will I get a job with these two subjects because it was very foreign to him. So I applied for a few positions and then I ended up at um, the medical faculty of the University of the Free State at the department chemical pathology, totally something different. Um, but it was great because I would have liked to, to, to go the medical doctor way, but um, I was sort of, uh, I didn't want to look open wounds and things in the eye, so I, it was much better to be a chemical pathology where the blood was contained nicely in tubes, and then I could work on that. So I did my master's, my, my honours, my master's in chemical pathology, um, and then I left my career path for about three years to raise my kids initially. But when I found that it's going to drive me up the wall to just be involved with kids at homework, I returned to uh, another position, but this time at zoology and entomology, where I um, so back to my roots actually. Okay. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, and there I started as a um, research assistant, actually, working in a half-time position, um, because it also suited me with regard to my children. And, um, yeah, I was involved in quite a few uh, tick-related uh, research projects, where I, um, and then at long last, at 2004, I was appointed as in a full-time position as researcher and lecturer. And then my real pass with ticks and the amazing creatures that they are started. If somebody told me that I'm going to work with ticks and be passionate about them beforehand, I would have laughed my head off. But as soon as you get to know these little creatures, you realize how amazing they actually are. So yeah, um, that's how I la had it landed up in the zoology and entomology department with oh. the academic <laughs> career. <laughs> Thank you so much, Doctor. And then, what are you currently working on? Currently, or since I was appointed, uh, we were especially interested in the um, resistance development of especially blue ticks. There are many different tick species. That's um, specifically the blue tick species have um, developed resistance to most of the chemical control uh, measures that they are that are used to control them. So um, to be able to advise farmers and pharmaceutical companies on what chemicals are still working in the field, we test samples that are um, submitted to our laboratory and then we can give them an answer as to what will work and what will not work. So uh, that is the main thing that we are, are busy with, but we also are, that's, um, yeah, we also um, embark on new ways to control ticks. So we look at alternative methods, since uh, chemical control is not the um, main answer, although that is the most important way in which ticks are controlled, but we also need to move away from that so that we are not um, 
find in a position where there's no way in which things can be controlled and um, therefore that will um, have a very adverse um, uh, effect on the farming industry because things can have a, a very detrimental effect on um, cattle farming. Thank you so much. Coming back to ticks, uh, Doctor, can you share with us how artificial intelligence can contribute in the field of zoology and entomology? I think it can play a role in that information can be gathered um, quicker to be able to plan research projects and um, yeah, that will enable us to perhaps get to a quicker answer on how to solve the problems with, with regard to tick resistance and tick, ticks in, the, in general in uh, the farming industry. Thank you so much. And then, Doctor, can you enlighten us about the intricate behavior, the physiological behavior of ticks and their adaptation to the surrounding? Well, this is where I get very um, enthusiastic about ticks. They are amazing creatures. They are very, very small when they initially need to find a host. Um, about, if I can um, give you an example, they are about as big as a, a pencil mark that a pencil mark make on the paper. And they need to find a big host like a, a cow or something like that, or a game animal. So they have different strategies in which they do that. We uh, divide them into two um, parts. One is the ambushes. They are ambushes where they get up onto the grasses and they will sit on the top of the grasses, usually as high as... They are very clever. They will crawl up as high as the host will be. So some tick species will go on uh, up higher, others will be a bit lower. And then they will wave their four legs in the air. That four legs have um, sensory organs that will be able to detect a host when it's close by. And as soon as the host is um, passing them, they will attach to the host or crawl onto the host and then find a, a feeding place on the host. Um, and then we also have another class that we call the hunted ticks. They will hide under the ground. And as soon as they get the stimuli of CO2 and uh, movement and the specific scent of the animal, they will also crawl out from under the ground and actively run towards the host and get onto the host. So they, this is now especially the hard ticks that I'm talking about. The soft ticks have other um, uh, ways of finding their host, but we are mainly concerned with hard ticks at our facility. And then they have also very interesting ways of finding a specific feeding place on the host. So, for instance, the different species will have different places where they will feed. Some will feed in the ears of the animal, the others will feed under the tail, others will feed on certain body parts. So they are also adapted to be able to find that specific place with regard to the sensory organs on the four legs and on the mouth parts. Uh, an interesting fact is that we don't talk about a pig's head. It doesn't have a head. It does have a body and mouth parts. Because the mouth parts are very important with regard to the feeding. They need to feed on blood to be able to survive. And they only feed three times in their life as a larvae. So after that they are taken in a blood meal. They will hatch into the next um, stage, which will then be the nymph. The nymph need to take in another blood meal. She will, well, they are actually not female or male, they, are, uh, they only become um, male or female when they are adults. So the, the nymph will take in a blood meal. They will hatch into an adult, either a female or a male. And then they need to take in another blood meal, both the female and the male, to um, just get, uh, become sexually mature, then the female will proceed and she will enlarge about 100 times her initial size. And when she finished um, 
and then she will drop down, lay her eggs in the environment, and then she will die on the snow. Poor lady, the back then. It's on the cattle, they will go on seeking new females, but the uh, female thing will drop down and die after she, she's um, had her eggs. Lady. Wow, that's very interesting. There's a lot of other things that I can tell you. <laughs> so, but yeah, they are very meaning nice. the lesson that I have learned just now that these small creatures, we can learn a strategic leadership from them. Well, definitely, they don't give up. And that's the advice that I want to give the students as well. You never give up, you know, you break the new. Follow your passion and you, um, uh, when your path doesn't work out as you planned it, you look for alternatives and you follow that and you do what you can do to follow your passion. Wow. So, Doctor, <laughs> taking myself as an imagined livestock farmer, yeah. well, what advice can you give me pertaining to ticks? Yeah, that's also a difficult thing in South Africa. We've got communal farming, as you now uh, pretend to be one. Yes. And the farming system here is a bit more different than on commercial farms, because on commercial farms we have a closed farming system. No new animals is coming onto the farm without um, quarantine Correct. procedures and so on. With uh, emerging farmers in a communal area, they are um, the cattle are exposed to different circumstances. Other, um, you know, owners cattle will, cattle will also walk around. They might have other ticks, or they might might have resistant ticks that will uh, get onto the uh, be in the field and then be able to um, infest the cattle. But um, the but there's also many other ways in which you can control ticks, and especially. Um, uh, emerging farmer, if you don't have a big um, stock uh, or big, uh, yeah, you can perhaps. What they do is they take them into the crawls at night where the chickens and things are also, and the mostly the, the engorged females tend to drop when the sun rises. So if you then um, allow your chicks to, chickens to sort of um, be between the cattle. They can pick up that in both three months, they eat it, and that will prevent reinfestation later on, or at least control the number of ticks that is around. And um, yeah, uh, it's important. Chemical control is still important at some communal areas, the tanks are available. So, um, but I think an uh, upcoming farmer is, has the advantage of. Um, not such big herds, so they can look at the cattle more often. And I do believe that you don't need to get all the ticks from the cattle. You must leave some ticks on the cattle as well, so that the uh, cattle can become resistant against the ticks as well. And that's another way of controlling ticks, and to have uh, tick-resistant hosts or tick-resistant cattle to um, prevent the high infestation rates of the ticks on the cattle. Thank you so much, Doctor. And then, what strategies can we use apart from that to prevent this resistance? Well, I, I think all, overall there are different strategies, and one of them is tick resistant animals, which uh, is explored more and more. If we look towards the uh, um, commercial farmers, they also can vaccinate their animals against the diseases, because ticks not only cause damage due to their feeding activities, which plays a big role because that can decrease the production value of the animal. The, weight increase and the uh, milk um, uh, increase. So um, it is important to, so they can have a, a direct um, influence on the animal's health, but also they transmit diseases that can cause the animals to um, 
become ill and die off, you know, like, uh, like red water and hot, um, hot water and things like that. So, um, to prevent that, we need to um, make use of chemical control, but in that case, I'm actually sort of promoting our laboratory, I must say, in this situation, yes. because I feel that if you, uh, most farmers just go to the co-op or the pharmaceutical company and they buy whichever is the cheapest chemical, but it might not be the one that's going to work. Mm. So um, our facility put together a tick resistance profile that will uh, determine which acaricide is still working and which is not working, and if they, um, we, we can then advise them to, for instance, use amidines instead of pyrethroids or um, organophosphates instead of amidines and um, I, I sort of um, would like farmers to at least send in a tick sample once a year so that we can determine what the resistance profile is as long it's also important that as long as uh, a specific um, chemical is working for to control that specific uh, the ticks that you don't just chop and change between different acrosides. Use it until resistance or emerging resistance is determined for that specific chemical, then you can change over to another one. Um, and that will prolong the life um, cycle of the chemicals that are available for the um, control. The problem is that new chemicals are not really um, available in the foreseeable future because it takes a very long time to go through the different processes to in the end be able to say that it works for ticks. About it's 15 to 20 years and to get it registered even more. And there are no new acrocytes that's really in the pipeline that will work for tick um, control. So um, it's important to conserve the chemicals that we have and perhaps um, also, altern, alternate it with other methodologies as well, like um, keeping the grass um, shorter, so then the, the pigs can't get onto the grasses. So, uh, using different animal stocks in a specific field that graze on different um, heights of uh, grasses and so on. Yeah. Wow, thank you so much, Doctor. And then, are there any exciting gaps in your field? Yeah, I think the main um, gaps is that we need to look for new control measures, you know, and um, we are currently also, one of our students are looking at the hormone levels in the animals so that you don't need um, to see whether there's an influence, you know, because we find that, that in younger animals is not that high to close. Older animals have higher tick loads uh, when um, they are, uh, the, cat, the uh, calves are still with the cattle, there might be another uh, uh, influence on the hormonal levels that will prevent or cause ticks to get onto the cattle. So I think the gap, there is, <laughs> tick research is one big gap, I think, <laughs> because we also need to know more and more of the um, physiological aspect of the ticks with regard to there are tick species that are well described but there's still a lot of tick species that needs to be more investigated more um, in South Africa there's about 80 ticks different 80 tick species of which about 14 are of uh, veterinary importance um, so they will infest different animals some will infest sheep, others will infest cattle and so on so those life cycles and interaction with um, you know, the environment still needs to be clarified uh, worldwide there's around 900 different big species of which I is found in South, in South Africa so um, to me it feels there's so many gaps you know, every time we do a research project there's something that we discover also needs to be investigated. Yeah. Wow. Okay, thank you so much, Doctor. And then, global warming. 
what role does it play in the mushrooming of ticks? Yeah, <laughs> that's an interesting question because you know, ticks are um, adapted to certain environments, you know, with certain humidities and um, certain temperatures. And as temperature changes takes place or humidity, we find that we now have rain in the free state in the winter, you know. So the Arctic that are adapted to drier environments and the Arctic adapted to more wet environments. So if the environment change, more tick species will be available to adapt in that specific area. And with that, they will also bring the diseases that they transmit. So that will cause uh, perhaps the, the increase of disease transmission in areas where it previously wasn't present. Okay, thank you so much, Doctor. And then, how do you determine the infestations of ticks with regard to the location, the season, and also the age of the host? Okay. Yeah, well, the, uh, the, if I understand you correctly, you want to know what the uh, tick loads on the fields and on the animals okay. is. So we have different methodologies in which we do that. What we do is what we call it tick drags in the field, which is flannel strips about a meter by a meter um, attached to a rod and a string, and we uh, pull it behind us, you know. And the ticks that are questing will then attach to... Uh, we also um, uh, um, wrap that strips on, so for instance, cattle. So it's got that cattle smell. We walk in front of it. It's got our movement as well as the CO2 that we exhale. And that will excite them to attach to the strips when we walk past. So that's one of the ways we will, for instance, do a 400 meter um, strips dragging. So, so uh, and then we pick off the small larvae from there and can determine which big species are there and which, um, yeah, what stages are in the field at the moment. The, depending on the season, um, we will find different uh, profiles of the different big species and um, naturally also numbers. Most big species are inactive in the winter months, so they will go into a dire course or a resting phase. Uh, but in summer times we will be able to uh, pick up more ticks when we do the track. One of the way. We can also do CO2 traps where we put a little bottle on a, a flannel uh, piece of uh, material and we uh, release CO2 from that, what we call CO2 trap, and that will then get onto the flannel um, material as we will be picking up So that's too often better that we can determine in the field and then naturally adult ticks are more found on the host animals itself. Um, in our case we mostly look at the cattle but we also, uh, you can also, uh, intermediate host is sometimes smaller rodents and so on in the field so we can also catch and release uh, smaller uh, field animals and pick off the larva from them to see what is the general profile of the different species in the field. That's great. And then, Doctor, what <coughs> message can you share with aspiring researchers? Well, if you are interested in adventure and not spending all your time in an office, um, zoology and entomology is definitely the direction for you. So you need to embark on the studies. Because we do a lot of field work, we are, um, as you can hear, we need to be in the field where the ticks and whatever um, animals we are, the different researchers are investigating. investigating. So um, we call our um, courses a um, direction in um, adventure in nature. Okay, and then. Um, yeah, you must be passionate about animals. If you want to do animals, including from the smallest to the largest insects and so on, there, um, as I've just 
revealed with regard to ticks, they are so interesting, and so I'm sure every different tick species or other insect species, animal species, animal behavior, has a lot of interesting aspects that you can um, investigate. Um, so if you are interested in um, nature as a whole, this is the right direction for you. But then also you must be able to work hard, um, to seek opportunities. You know, you will never reach your, your goal or the end of your passion without working hard, without doing more than the normal. So you must be prepared to start at the bottom and do everything from washing dishes, cleaning labs, um, and then work yourself up to the other stuff as well. I still at my, my age and my position do wash dishes when I did some experiments. So nothing must be beneath you. You must crawl in the beneath uh, underneath bushes and over animals and so on. So you, you mustn't be frail. You must be determined to um, get to your goal. Thank you, Doctor. And then coming back to, to ticks, uh, apart from their economical impact to the livestock of the farmer, is there any significant role that they play in the ecosystem? Yes, in nature where the humans um, don't interfere, you know, with game animals and so on, their role is to get rid of the weak animals in the system so that the genetics are not um, carried through to the progeny. So they does have a role to play, even though we want to kill them as soon as we see them on our cattle. <laughs> and in, 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 even in the uh, um, farming industry, if you find, you will find that some animals in your herd will have more ticks than others, constantly. You know, and um, that will also be an indication to you that that's a weak animal. So you can use that information to better your herd as well. Oh, that's great. And then, Doctor, apart from the research, what are your other interests? Well, I'm sort of a handy woman. I like to do things with my hands. I like to do woodwork and dress storing my, uh, my furniture and painting my house and, you know, do active things in and around the house. And then reading, um, if, if you are a, a scientist, you must be able to read a lot. You know, you must be very fond of reading, not only, um, you know, light literature, but um, uh, subjects related literature as well. So reading is an important thing for me as well, to be able to get behind how everything works. Thank you so much. And then lastly, Doctor, you talk about reading and then being active. There's one thing that we always neglect, our mental health. What message can you share with us about maintaining a good mental health? Well, I think that all um, comes down to a balanced life, you know. The problem with um, researchers in natural sciences and in zoology and entomology specifically is they are so passionate about their work that they sometimes forget that they also need to relax away from work. So I think you need to have that balance and to realize that work is work but you also need to get away from that every now and again. And that's the difficult part, you know, because if you, you know, we need travel, I see a herd of cattle on the field and I want my husband to slow down so I can see, is, is there not perhaps an overload of ticks on them or something like that? I don't switch off, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so you must learn to switch off as well sometimes to keep that balance going. Uh, and, you know, uh, take part in, in other activities as well, like some sport activities and things like that, to also keep your body going, because you also need to have 
a healthy body to be able to go into the field and to get all this stuff. Thank you so much, Doctor. We really appreciate your time and we are thankful that you have shared with us a new knowledge and then also enlighten us about the ticks. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Well, that's a pleasure. I hope everybody will now want to come and chase ticks. Yes. That's out there and wanting a, a career in adventure. Thank you. Thank you.